I just want to first of all thank everybody for uh, joining our call today. Um, you're in for a treat. I've had the pleasure of uh, listening to Ryan speak uh, twice actually, and he gives a great presentation. And uh, with us today we have Mike Frechet, um that from the Vice President of Western Canada for Home Trust, who's just going to do Ryan's intro. So, and again, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please type them into the balloon box, and uh, we can get started with today's um, here from the Pro Series. And Mike, go ahead. Thank you, Jared. Ryan Walter played and coached more than 1,100 games over 17 seasons in the National Hockey League. Drafted second overall by the Washington, Washington Capitals, Ryan was named the youngest NHL captain, won a Stanley Cup with the Montreal Canadiens, and finished his playing career with his hometown Vancouver Canucks. Ryan was an NHL All-Star and three-time Team Canada member, World Junior Captain, Vice President of the National Hockey League's Player Association, BC Hockey Hall of Fame inductee, and NHL Man of the Year. Ryan won a gold medal as head coach of Canada's national women's hockey team, has been the founding partner in two startup companies, a TV hockey analyst, hockey expert and actor, board and electronic game creator, and the president of a professional hockey team. Ryan has a master's degree in leadership and business, is the author of five books, and sits on the board of directors of the Hockey Canada Foundation and the Seton Hall School of Business Leadership Advisory Council. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Walter. Well, thank you very much, Mike. And uh, Jared, thank you for your help. Uh, Melissa, uh, Pin, it's been great to work with everybody here. In our morning, uh, the little session that we'll do tomorrow or this morning, and it'll go quick, will be to really connect some principles out of uh, winning at the hockey level, at the NHL level, you know, high performance at the NHL level, and and then uh, transferring those pieces into business and life. And, uh, Jared, I'm going to, with your permission, I'll get you to hit that next slide there. It should say Friday, May 23rd. It's Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. You're you're gonna have. I I don't have. I can't see it here, so I'm just gonna go off of my slide. Uh, All right. I'll tell you folks, next. Yeah, I'll just tell you when, right? So we're good awesome. to go, folks. Next, uh, you know, uh, May 23, 1986. Now I chuckle a little bit uh, for everybody on the line because uh, some of you might not have been born <laughs> back in those days, but uh, a very uh, important thing happened in in the life of. Uh, Ryan Walter, and think about this. I'm just a kid from the top of Caribou Hill in Burnaby. I should have never played in the NHL. I should have never won a Stanley Cup. And on that day, the 23rd of May, 1986, in Calgary, you would probably agree with me that that was, you know, maybe right up there in regards to a high-performance win and, and the outcome that we were looking for. Everybody on the call has outcomes. You have desires. You you have uh, specific goals that you're going to work towards. And we were fortunate on the 23rd of May, 1986 to hit that. So Jared, if you'll hit that next slide, there's, um, I, I do have to say folks that uh, that is photoshopped. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I did get Big a picture of you though, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you to get the, to win that Stanley Cup. And and you know, we're very thankful. And, and uh, it's great to be able to lift that cup. Let's go to the next slide, and here's the key. Um, I want to share just a couple of lessons that I've learned, uh, you know, especially, I certainly have been in business for the last 30 years, but, uh, you know, sort of that, I've been in hockey for 50 years, and over the, my course, the course of 17 seasons in the NHL as a player and coach, I've learned some lessons. The greatest thing about hockey is I think it just accentuates the learning curve. So we hit the next slide there, and there's the key. So in my uh, big learning curve, uh, not only from winning a Stanley Cup, but for uh, you know, other pieces of success that we've all had, isn't that true? The success comes from focusing on process, not outcome. Next slide. You know, If you look at maybe the best uh, example of this is a little tiny quote from John Wooden. John Wooden, I don't know if some of you may or may not know John Wooden. He was the winningest basketball coach in in NCAA history, and he said this. He said, I don't worry about winning or losing. Now think about that. In other words, he's not focused on the outcome. 
He said, I worry or I focus a lot on practicing the details that give us the win. Next slide, folks, there's the difference, right? In my lifetime, I have met people in both of these areas. <laughs> I've also been in both of these areas. In other words, it's interesting. You know, fans live life hoping to make things happen, hoping for an outcome. You know, they buy the hot dog. They've got the beer. They're sitting at the game. They're cheering their team on. We're, we hope to win tonight. And players make it happen. And there's a huge psychological difference between is this your team or do you just play on this team? So next slide, um, we're going to talk about uh, three sort of specific areas that we want to spend some time with. I promise you we'll have uh, some takeaways. We're going to have some lots of story. And, uh, you know, let me, let me just say that there's many more, obviously, uh, principles that we can take out of the, the game of hockey and transfer into business. But I want to focus. These are core, aren't they? These are the core ones. So, so assuming responsibility, I want to tell you some stories around uh, when, you know, I thought that I was assuming responsibility, but really I hadn't bought in. Uh, number two, activating accountability. You know, how, how do I hold myself? And, my P and our people accountable at a high level? What works? And then finally, and most of us in life, I always say we're all in sales. We're either you know, selling internally or we're selling externally. Uh, but, um, and if you don't like the word sales, then you know, we could say we're all in an influence position because leadership is influence. So de developing likability, we'll, we'll have some fun with that at the end. So our next slide there, assuming responsibility. I have a great uh, reminder of this in my life. Um, when I was a captain for the Washington Capitals down in Washington, D.C., I had a very good friend, Gordy Lane. He, played, he was a big defenseman. He was a 6'7 defenseman on our team. But uh, Gordy was a hunter, and he loved to hunt east in, in the eastern shore of, of Washington. Now, I don't know if you know that, but down in D.C., I mean, they've got the beautiful – uh, Eastern Shore, and, and all the Canadian geese would come down in winter there. So I, I'm not a hunter. I need to say that. I love the fish, but I'm just not a hunter. I'm not a gun guy. I mean, I guess I could become one. But anyway, I used to go with Gordy out to the Eastern Shore, and I would sit there, and i just relax. It was a good way, good way for me to wind down and get away from things. One day, we're going out to the Eastern Shore, and Gordy, in his pickup truck, he's got two guns and two licenses. And I said, Gordy, you know, what, what's the second gun and the second license for? And my friend Gordy, he's, he's such a sweet guy. He, he had a real bad stutter. And he said to me, J -j -j just in case. And I said, well, what do you mean just in case? He said, well, you, you might want to shoot. And I looked at the, at the license, and it was Dennis Hextall's license. Now, this is a teammate of ours. And Dennis Hextall had red hair and was 36 years old. I had brown hair and I was 22. You can see where this is going, right? So we, we spent the day out. Uh, I, I didn't hit anything. I shot once and hit a cloud. Uh, but we're picking up the geese. Gordy uh, bagged two geese. And we're just picking up a little bit late. And two men jump out of the bush in pinstripe three-piece suits. And they hold out their badge and they say, drop the guns, FBI. Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine what's going through my mind? The guy looks at and he says, hand me your license, kid. And he, he looks at my license. And it's Dennis Hextall with red hair. He looks at me. He looks back at the license. And he says, uh, son, I think you're in a lot of trouble. I paid thousands of dollars worth of fines to get, you know, remedy that situation. And, and, and you know, the, the thing that hit me, the next week as I was, you know, obviously upset about it and, and upset at Gordy for bringing me the gun and all of that was, you know, that wasn't Gordy's fault. I was responsible for that decision. <laughs> it hit me. I'm a young captain in the NHL. Ryan, you, if you don't take responsibility for the direction of your life, if you always blame others, and in Washington we were good at that, uh, things won't come out well. So let's hit the next slide there. 
Thanks, Jared. Uh, there's a good thought. For eight out of ten people, self-image is the key driver of performance. Uh, don't you don't you agree with that, leaders? And, and everybody on the call is a leader. Uh, I believe in the concept that it's leaders leading leaders and leaders following leaders. We in this society, with the pace of the of business, we don't have time to be following. We need to grow ourselves as a leader. So eight out of 10 people, self-image is the key driver to performance. Next slide. Uh, there's a, a great article in the Vancouver Sun, so it might, must be true, right? You, you guys know, some of you are from Vancouver, it must be true. And uh, we ended up, uh, I ended up finding this article, and it was about this uh, gentleman back in the Bronx, his name was Mr. Lane. And Mr. and Mrs. Lane uh, named their first son, Winner Lane. Wow, pretty cool. Think about that. You know, can you imagine high school? Hey, get over here, winner. Uh, they had two more girls, and I, I would tell you the names of the girls, but I, they didn't tell us in the article. And then they had a fourth child, a second son. They weren't sure what to name the kid, so the oldest daughter goes to dad and says, Dad, you got a winner. <laughs> yes. They named their their second child, their fourth, their, their second son, their fourth child, Loser Lane. Can you imagine high school? <clears throat> hey, Loser, get over here. <clears throat> so the cool thing about the article is it tracked both these boys for the next 25 years. Winter Lane went on to create 13 crimes and, and, and spent three years in an Elmira prison. Loser Lane went on to be a great athlete, got a scholarship to university, graduated university, and is a cop in the North Bronx. And the article should have said, but it didn't. It never matters what people call us, right? It, do you know what I've been called on NHL ice? <laughs> I'd be shriveled up in a corner in a fetal ball if I believed any of that. But here's the other thing that's critical, right? And we all know this. It really matters what we call ourselves. Our self-image is the best indicator of our future performance. We're going to talk lots about this uh, in, in future opportunities that we get together. Uh, next slide. So, you know, there's the key. I mean, how we choose to feel. And we actually have a, what we call a thinking tendencies model that allows people to, to really connect in at, at, this, at this level. And, uh, and you know, we're, uh, the thinking tendencies model gives you and it gives me uh, the ability, I'm just going to sneak in here, sorry, gives us the ability to actually understand our mindset. So that, that's, that's pretty fun. And we're pretty thankful for this model. Um, the other thing that I want to fire at you is, uh, and we'll hit the next slide here, is that everyone over 19 years old is responsible for their own face. I'm, I am telling you, and I'm just checking in, Jared. You're there, right? Yes, I, I am. Make sure. yep. Okay, perfect. We're good. Uh, that, that I heard someone once say this, and I chuckled, but someone once said to me that after 19, you're responsible for what your face looks like. And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well... You know, or do you choose to smile or have you always got a frown? And I thought, that's great. Let's hit the next slide and then the next slide. So we're, at, we're on ice time here, Jared. Um, so who, you know, this is in the world of hockey folks. You're going you're gonna to laugh at me, but I often ask young hockey players, who is in control of a player's ice time? You know, if you talk to Mike Keenan or you talk to an NHL coach, Really, the NHL coach is a distributor of ice time. But, but really, the question is, folks, who's in control of the player's ice time? And I always say the player is. If I want more ice time, I, I become a better player. Right? It's not anybody else's responsibility. Otherwise, I've lost control of that opportunity. So, Jared, I'm just going to go to the Caps versus the Canadians, which is two, three slides down. Just let me know that you've got that. We got there, yep. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so uh, I'm going to end up with this, this little piece on a, a really important aha moment for me 
and a lesson that I learned uh, from playing with the Washington Capitals and then the Montreal Canadiens. You know, with the Capitals, we were not having much success. Now, we were a growing team. We were getting better. But one of the key thoughts that really hit me recently is with the Caps, we would blame the referee for our loss. We always had an excuse for the loss. Isn't that hilarious? I mean, I'm thinking to myself, you know, if the, if the referee made a bad call, we lost the game because of him. I got to the Montreal Canadiens in 1982. I was traded there. And the huge difference as I look back, and the Canadians had won five Stanley Cups in the 80s, is that there was no excuses. You won or you lost, and you better not lose often <laughs> because in Montreal, right, they crucify you if you lose. And I thought, wow, what a difference in mindset. You know, on one side, we looked for other people to blame when things didn't go our way. On the Canadian side, we, it, there was no excuses allowed. It was you just put your best on the ice every night. And I love that concept. And next slide sort of helps me in, you know, as I think about my own business. You know, do I own the business or do I work in the business? And as the president and CEO of the Abbotsford Heat over the last three years and before they moved away, you know, what was a real good indicator for me, you guys are going to laugh at me here. When I go into a washroom, you know, in, in our building, in the arena, and there's, let's say there's, uh, I don't know, you're, you're going to laugh. There's, you know, towelettes or toilet pieces of toilet paper or stuff sitting on the floor. The indicator for me in my own life was, is this my building? Like, do I pick that up and clean that up or do I wait for someone else to clean it up? Wow, that was a huge, huge indicator for me. You know, is it my business? Is it my team? Is it my team or do I just play for this team? And that, that commitment, you know, that sort of idea that I'm taking personal responsibility is absolutely key. Next slide. So there's the big one. And I'm working. I'm not pointing fingers here, folks. I am actually working on this myself. And that's been a, a huge aha moment. Next slide, Jared. Uh, so let's move. So, you know, assuming responsibility, I think sometimes we take it for granted, don't we? I work here. I'm responsible. But the best of the best find a way to really hold themselves responsible at a high level. How about this one? Here's the, here's not a, this is not a happy word. Activating accountability. And the next slide, Jared, has Mike Gartner, Bob Gainey, Larry Robinson, Trevor Linden, Pavel Burry. Can I tell you that I had a chance throughout my hockey career to play with the best of the best. And the one thing that I found about all of these amazing players is they held themselves accountable at a high level. They also allowed their coach and other players to hold them, them accountable to get high results. So let's talk about accountability. Next slide. You know, I believe that if we're not getting the results that we want, then we don't have enough clarity around how to do it and what we want. So around outcome and process. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, you know, I don't know if anybody's seen the movie Miracle, but I was the referee in the movie Miracle. Now you've got to go back and look at it. And, and I, I learned a really important thing from the movie Miracle. I asked uh, the young director, Gavin O'Connor, I said, Gavin, I, I know lots about hockey, but I don't know a lot about movie making. And he held his hands up, you know, in a sort of this framing way. You know how the directors actually frame things in? And, and he held up his hands, and if you go to the next slide, Jared, um, and he, he actually he, he started to do that with his hands. I'm going, come on, Gavin, it can't be that. And he said, Ryan, here's the key. He said, in movies, in making movies, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to move a camera. He said, we never move a camera until we know exactly the shot we want. So our little, you know, sort of fun little piece as we talk about clarity is what are the things that you want more in your business? Do you know exactly what you want? And have you framed in that 
whole that picture? Are you looking before it happens? Are you visualizing your movie? The coolest thing is, what if we all got on the phone 20 years from now and we and we had a huge brainstorm discussion and we said, OK, 20 years from now, let's look back at this moment and, and the clarity that we were able to generate. What do you want more of? And next slide, Jared, what do you want less of in your business today? Wouldn't it be great to be 20 years down the road, look back at this as a significant time of change? Really, the question, uh, great performers, is, is, is what do you want to accomplish over the next 20 years? Maybe that's too long of a time limit, time period. But if you have clarity today, you're going to look back at a movie that you're proud of. Let's hit next slide. So there's maybe our little challenge, you know, of the morning is, is, you know, let's frame in one change that we're going to hold each other accountable today. Okay. So um, let me just go, Jared, to uh, the slide that has people don't buy what you sell. Simon Simic. All right. Did you get that slide? I just jumped in. Yep, we're there, Brian. Awesome. And uh, folks, sorry about this. My, uh, my little uh, computer must have froze on me, but uh, next time we'll, it'll nail it. We'll nail it. But Simon Simic says this, people don't buy what you sell. They buy why you sell. That's a great point. Next slide. Am I allowed to add in to someone else's quote? <laughs> I don't think you're allowed to do that. But I believe that people don't buy what you sell, but they buy what, I'm sorry, don't buy what you sell. They buy why you sell it. And would you agree with me, folks? They buy you. It's really, if we hit the next slide, let's look quickly as we sort of start to, you know, wind down here. Let's look at, at, at um, this, and this was on, uh, this is a little quadrant in our book, Hungry. Let's look at us and, and sort of our emotional state as we're selling, as we're leading. So high end of purpose, high end of passion, bottom end of purpose, bottom end of passion. Next slide. That is a, and that's a tough word, isn't it, folks, ambivalent? Now, if you and I could, uh, you know, we're in a room together, I'd be asking you, what does ambivalent mean to you? Let me give it to you from my perspective. I don't care. Did you know emotionally that about almost 30% of the corporate North American workforce is disengaged? How could that be? I always say, get a new job because you're not ruining the, company, although you're doing that, you're really ruining your life. Let's go next slide, Jared. Uh, top end of purpose, bottom end of passion, frustrated. This is every NHL coach. They know exactly what to do to get the win, but they can't always get the high energy of their team in a place to get the win. Next slide. Top end of passion, bottom end of purpose. We're entertained. We're just sort of enjoying life like it it, that's good, but it's more about bouncing around. We're passionate about a bunch of things. We haven't found our high purpose. And next slide, there's an indicator of how to win a Stanley Cup. Top end of purpose, top end of passion. Don't you love the word hungry? Next slide, Jared. Here's the indicators of a hungry spirit. So energized, open, determined, confident, and excited. Aren't those great indicators? So really what we'd say to each other right now, it's not me pointing at you, is are those the indicators of your Monday morning, right? As we come into our workplace, does this, these are the indicators of the best of the best. And they, they find a way to hold themselves accountable to that high energized um, um, emotional side. Uh, next slide, Ferdinand Folk nails it the most powerful weapon on earth is the human soul and fire. And when we have a little more time together, we, we talk about how do we engage around this thinking tendencies model? How do we understand our thinking so that we can drive our emotional best? Next slide, by the way, and I know this isn't for everybody, but uh, we're going to have a, an owner conference uh, in uh, Quebec City, and uh, I get a chance to speak to, to our, our team there. And we're going to really focus in on this model in understanding the mindset uh, personally and culturally of our people. So we'll have some fun with that. 
Uh, next slide. Here's a look at uh, at the model, and, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but we'll, we'll spend a lot of time just focusing in on on understanding mindset, and I think it's the key component to really uh, performing consistently at a high level. Final slide. We're going to uh, start to end up here. Let's go to developing likability as our NHL high performance third sort of uh, aha moment for me. Would we agree, next slide, that everybody plays on a team? You know, I, people say, well, golfers don't. Well, have you ever seen, you know, Tiger Woods' coach and, and caddy? And, you know, like we, we all play on team. And so uh, next slide, you know, uh, it, it, when you think of likability, isn't it true that people very seldom buy products, they buy you. They buy you. And so people do business with people that they like. And I'm going to just end up our time together by quickly looking at three keys to likability in my mind. The first is, the, is real, is that I am who I am, right? And we'll look very quickly at the four characteristics that people want in you. The second is reciprocity. I love this one. People live on reciprocity. And the third is resilience. I think most of us love to really connect deeply with people who have lived a resilient life. Okay? Um, I'm going to ask you, uh, leaders, uh, leadership characteristics, next slide here. You know, the, and this is from Pauser and Kuzis, and this is a worldwide study of what people want in their leader. And, and what, we, what we do here is we normally put you in groups of fours and have you sort of figure it out, but I'm going to ask you uh, to do this on your own just quickly. So what are the top four, ter- four characteristics that people want in their leader? And next slide there, Jared, should have 20 characteristics. And, and I'm just going to walk through this quickly because uh, obviously we don't have a direct connect uh, in a room to look at each other. But, uh, you know, there, would you agree, folks, on the line that those are pretty good? The top 20 are pretty good. And I would ask you to sort of go back maybe after the call and, and look at the four that you would connect on. I'm going to now give you Pauser and Kuzas four, and we'll talk about it quickly. Next slide, and then the next slide should have competent as your number four. You might want to write these down because... Um, worldwide, this is for the last eight years running worldwide, these are the top four characteristics that people want in their leader. In other words, in, 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 in what your client wants in you. Okay. So competence is a good one. Let's go to the next slide. The third is inspiring. Oh, let's go to the next slide. Fourth, and then go to the next slide, Jared. Uh, so we've got honest, forward-looking, inspiring, and, and competence. And I think that's a key component to what people want in us. In, in regards to likability, we can actually just spend some time thinking about these four um, characteristics that people want in us. And, and one of the uh, things that we can do and you could do on your own is actually sort of rate yourselves in, in each of these four areas. As I'm, you know, in a client meeting or I'm in an internal meeting, you know, I'm in a leadership meeting, you know, are these four uh, thing characteristics that people could point at in my leadership? Next slide, reciprocity. And we're going to finish up here. Um, I love this word, you know, uh, doesn't business run on reciprocity? So uh, next slide, uh, Robert Cialdini has an amazing six principles of influence. If you haven't um, taken his course or read his book, that's a great read. You want to influence clients ethically. Number one principle of influence is reciprocity. You scratch my back, so I'll scratch yours. Next slide. Here's the key to reciprocity. Give first. You know, sometimes I'll do a, um, a large uh, convention and, and people will give uh, my book away as a, the convention a prize or a gift. And I always, and most of the conventions give it away at the end of the convention. I always say to uh, organizers of conventions, give the book first. Put it on the pillow. I'll sign it personally. 
put it on the pillow of the hotel room. When the person arrives in their hotel room, they get the gift. When the principle of reciprocity works ethically when we give first, it creates. And what I've found is I'll give a $3 book to a client and, and end up getting a $10,000 deal. It's never equal. The principle of reciprocity is gigantic. Uh, next slide, we'll finish with resilience. And uh, we'll be finished up. And the next slide is that people meet us in our pain. You know, people like to know resilient people. And I used to really admire uh, the, the, pl the players on my team that were resilient. Um, next slide, Herbert Kaufman says, failure is only postponed success as long as courage coaches ambition. The habit of persistence is the habit of victory. Isn't that true? Resilience is how you win. It's absolutely true. Next slide, a very dear friend of mine, Pat Quinn, bless his heart, passed recently here in Vancouver. He had a, he had a big uh, plaque in the back of his coaching wall, and it said that, a failed project is not a failed person. How do you know, folks, how many times I've failed? It's crazy. And yet, you know, out of failure comes success, correct? Let me leave you with a couple of thoughts, and, and we'll be done. There's a guy by the name of Abe Poland. I want you to just have one story at the end here. And Abe was the uh, owner of our team in Washington. Have you ever, have you ever done this in your life? I, I went 15, 20 years uh, and to a point where I, I, all of a sudden I, I hadn't called Abe. Like I hadn't talked to Abe in 15 years. And so my tummy said, call Abe. So I called Abe Poland. He said, Ryan, why did you call today? I said, I don't know. Abe. My tummy said, call Abe. And, and so he said, well, tonight I'm winning the Entrepreneur of the Year Award for Washington, D.C. I said, Abe, congratulations. I said, Abe, you're going you're gonna to receive a trophy. That means you give a speech. I said, Abe, what are you going to talk about? And he said, Ryan, I'm going to talk about one thing, one story. I said, Abe, you've got to give me the story. He said, I'll tell you the story. He said, when I was 16 years old, I had two best friends. All three of us had one objective. We were going to make the high school basketball team. He said, all summer, we, we shot baskets, we lifted weights, we ran, and we were on track to just do unbelievable things that year with basketball. He said, Ryan, everything was on track for us to make the team until two days before tryouts. He said, two days before tryouts, he said, I chickened out. He said, Ryan, two days before tryouts, I chickened out. He said, I, that's, that fall, I stood in the stands and I watched my two best friends not only make a team, but win a championship. He said, that fall, I stood in the stands and I watched other people do what I should have been doing. He said, that fall, I stood in the stands and I swore to myself, I would not chicken out of life again. If it was up to me, I'd get it done. And Abe died a billionaire. Not the money is everything. Changed his life. But here's the key. I asked Abe the follow-up question. I said, Abe, You've made companies, you've lost companies, you know, it wasn't always perfect in your life. Tell me, how much of the time did it really work out? And he laughed and laughed and laughed. He said, Ryan, 51% of the time. Isn't that true, leaders, as we finish up this call? Doesn't 49% of our hard work and our tough time, we hope, create 51% of our success? So in the next slide, we'll end up, and that's our story. You know, 1986, we win a cup. You saw the 23rd of May. I started with it. That was our success. But what you didn't know is on the 15th of February, 1986, we were a dysfunctional team. We were underperforming. We could have never sort of actually saw the, the Stanley Cup run in our mind. And yet, with a change in mindset, in a change in responsibility, accountability, and team, we were able to accomplish that goal. So uh, as we hit the next slide, uh, Jared, I'm finished up. That's really the three pieces that we wanted to talk about. Obviously, we can go much deeper. And in Quebec City, with uh, the few of our friends that are on the line that are going to be there, we're going to go real deep into 
the one area of mindset. How, how do we lead and change and shift the mindset of our performing people? So I want to sort of leave it with you, Jared and uh, Mike, and uh, I want to thank everybody on the call. If you have questions for me, I mean, uh, if you have a couple minutes, this is a great time. Otherwise, I can certainly, uh, you can fire questions at any time to Ryan at RyanWalter.com also. Thanks so much. Ryan, uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, the presentation today. Um, there were some definitely some great nuggets in there. And uh, if anyone does have any questions, if you want to type them into the Bloom box, uh, we can. Uh, I'll ask them to Ryan right now. And, of course, uh, we do have one question right off the bat, Ryan, which is, uh, in your lifetime, who is your greatest influence and why? Great question. Great question. You know, I think there are so many influences in my life. Like, I think most of us look back at our folks, and my mother and father were amazing. You know, I, I people come to Jenny and I, my wife and I, and they say, how do we, how do we grow an NHL player? And I always deflect and say, <clears throat> excuse me, go talk to my mom and dad, right? Like they never pushed, but they were always supportive. They were always involved. My dad I, was either the GM or the coach of every team I played on, right until Bannon, right? So they always found a way to connect with us, but they didn't you know, push the next level, and they didn't force us to do it. I always say I can tell the difference between uh, and with a, watching a young hockey player if it's, if it's the player's dream or the dad's dream. And that is, you know, the player is five foot six, and he goes into the corner, the puck's in the corner with a defenseman that's six foot five. And if that, you know, player that's five foot six finds a way to get the puck and come out of the corner with it, it's his dream. Right at the end of the day, uh, people influence us in different ways. I would also say that, you know, I've had uh, profs at university that were great influences on me. I think my wife, Jenny, is a huge influence on me. Really, if you want to think about influence, look at the five people that you hang around with most. And, and just look at the influence that they have in your life, making sure that it's positive and forward-looking as an influence because those five people will be an indicator that influence will be an indicator of your future performance. For one well, quick question, Ryan, which is another good question, is of course you've had so much success at various levels and everything. What continues to drive you now? <clears throat> oh, that's a great question. Do you know that's finally why we had to write our, our final, our recent book, Hungry, Hungry, fueling your best game. Like I'm, I, I think until the, you know, until the. You know, the, or my creator takes me away. I want to stay hungry. I want us to be, you know, I want our grandkids to be hungry. Jenny and I are so excited about our, our three grandkids. I want our kids to stay hungry. You know, I want to stay hungry spiritually. I want to stay hungry in business. I want to stay hungry in marriage. I think the key to an amazing life is to, is to really stay hungry and to find ways to help each other stay hungry. So, I, you know, when I get up in the morning, I'm, I'm looking at that. I'm looking at what are the pieces of life that allow me to stay hungry and, and what impact does that make on the other, you know, sort of areas of my life. I would say that the, if you were to ask me for one thing that drives my hungry spirit, it's this. It's giving back, right? Like, I love accomplishing things, and I'm in the accomplishment performance mode. But I think if I can't find a way to add value to your lives, then I don't want to do it. So that really drives me right now. It's, it's the purpose. It's the, it's the value equation. If, if I'm not here to sell. I, I'm here to add value. And I think that's a key differentiator between the best and the rest. Very well said. And I think on that note, we'll uh, let you get on with your day. And, of course, we thank everybody else who uh, was on the call today. Very good uh, presentation today, Ryan. And uh, we look forward to uh, hearing more of it uh, in the future. Thanks, everybody. I had a great time with you. I wish I could see you all. But fire any other questions just at ryanwalter.com. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Right. Okay. Bye, everybody.